this afternoon. Have you people who are coming in for your second go around, have you checked your walking pictures with your first walking pictures? No, the first walking pictures are fine away. We didn't get those out. No excuse, no rationalization. You know the old lady. She's an old, you know what. So those first walking pictures are coming up. Now this is the first order of the, the afternoon. Go and see those walking pictures. And see whether you've changed. And if you haven't, get your money back. This afternoon is going to be 11th hours and what you are going to see tomorrow is going to be first hours and you people who are new on the job are going to have to shine up your eyes this is not easy you're going to have to shine up your eyes to see the difference and you're going to have to shine up your brains to always keep that difference in mind to realize that what you're going to see this afternoon is not a first hour and that this is extremely confusing. But I don't know of any other way that I can run this combination group, and you need a combination group, because you people have to sit and see until, look until you see. And I don't know of any other way to handle this, and if any of you get real bright ideas, just tell me about it. So remember this, and when we talk about first hours, on senior days, which are the Monday and Wednesday combinations, we're not really talking about first hours. Now what we saw this morning was really a first hour. And what we're going to see tomorrow, all the way along, are going to be really first hours. But what we're going to see this afternoon are going to be 11th hours. Now, have you got those pictures, Lee? All the this. Nobody likes me around here. Somebody likes me. Uh, come on, at my doghouse, I have room for you. <laughs> okay. I have room for you. They don't even let me work. I, I didn't even have to see the others. I, I do walk differently. Seriously. <laughs> but did you not get your other picture taken? They were here. Yes, they were taken. Sharon doesn't have any because she didn't have any taken. But. Yeah, I didn't have a first hour. I came well, you have a after, after 10 or something. Yeah. yeah. No. And everybody else is before and after. Uh, what about Sharon? We weren't taking her picture last time. She didn't get a walking picture the first time. Because she wasn't a model. Right. Just a few more complications. Uh, well, at any rate, those of you who did do have did have your before one walking picture, and now have your before eleven walking picture, go and look at them, and hand them around to your neighbors. And some of you, just to cheer me up, say, far out. <laughs> Do a first hour on these 11th hour pictures. And you cannot do a first hour twice, any more than you can teach a child to read twice. When you've taught him to read, he reads. And he can go on to more sophisticated reading. But you can't teach him to read ABC twice. When he knows it, he knows it. And it is the same. This is really a very difficult idea to get sorted out in your own mind. It takes a while. I'm talking now particularly to you auditors. It takes a while to sort this idea out in your own mind that for example, what was done on Frank this morning, Frank is now going to use. And the Frank of this afternoon that's now driving back to San Francisco, in no sense, at no point in his body, is acting like the Frank that drove down this morning. It is a different man. You are working along a, a gradient scale and he is in a different spot on that scale. And this, as I say, is one of the difficult things that you have to struggle with, this recognition of the, the everlasting necessity for understanding relationship. Places on a scale. What has changed? What remains, what is now emerging as something that is apparently the problem? 
and this is all part of the bill. Now this afternoon, we are going to have these people who are senior students give each other first hours so that they get in practice to work on the rest of you tomorrow. <laughs> it's calling a spade a spade. It's calling a spade. So long as it's a spade, not a goddamn shovel, it's all right. <laughs> anyway, um, Fritz, how would you like to take on this guy? And how would you like to talk about what you are doing when you are doing it? Fritz is going to take on you. See if you stay up here instead of down there. You, you might escape. <laughs> if you don't get home. What I see mostly, Dr. Rolf, on uh, looking at uh, Don, I, in the chest and shoulders, across chest, I see a lot of horizontality there. Uh, I see less down in the feet and ankles. you're letting him get away with something that you shouldn't let him get away with, namely keeping his pants up so high that it disguises the top of the... Uh, okay, that pelvis. does that does change. It All does right. take a parallel, <laughs> which I didn't see in the pants. Now, this business of keeping pants on people is a great help in seeing them. I really mean this. You see much more uh, as you get to used to looking at people with pants or with pants and bras on, you see more about them as those lines of the clothing well, go. How it hangs. How yeah. hangs then you would, do you remember Fritz's pants the first day? I mean, do you remember Don's pants the first day? Do you remember how they just had no relationship to the contour of the hip structure? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's less parallel down in the pelvis area. Right. Up yeah. above. Yes. In, in through here. And here, we see where the lines coming across. Sorry, first time. Yeah, but you see, what he's doing is remembering his first hour. Right. That's right. Go right along. I also see uh, still a tightness in the shoulder binding, in where, where the shoulder girl joins on the trunk in here. Uh, yeah, 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 right by the thing through here. Now, turn to the side. Here. Now you see that pelvis is still turning too much. And it is turned much more than is quite apparent as you look at the front. Turned, you mean tipped? Tipped, um, yes. It's still tipped considerably too much. It still needs to go very considerably under. And as it gets under, it will ease off the strain in those legs. But do you remember particularly the symptom, Fritz, that had me much concern when Don first came in here. That circulatory blanching. Of his face, which is primarily, which is... Which is all gone. You have to remember this. You can't see it anymore. Well, it looked like a different the head was not the way the body at all. It had, it had a lot of power in the body, but not. And, and now this is uniform. And you see a lot of wonderful job we've done for you, Don. You didn't know this before. I didn't know it. <laughs> I saw it when I was doing things like the women. Oh good. That's why John, I that's like why that, I asked you to do the window. Four or five hours took two. Or an hour and a half. <laughs> I think that's about what I Well that's a pretty good job. Now, what are you gonna do with the guy? Now there's one thing more. Uh stay up there for a minute. Back back. Uh turn around. As you get people organized you can take a piece of cardboard and lay it against their back and have their back touching all across that shoulder section and down. You don't have to fit the cardboard on. Now this has not yet happened with Don. It has happened, it is there more than it was there when we first started. But it still is not so that you could lay a cardboard across those scapulae and have the spine approximating the cardboard. And the upper dorsal seems a little bit flat and the, and the groove along the, the left yes, shoulder is... Yes, but realize that you couldn't possibly have a pelvis like that and have an upper dorsal such as we're looking for. You cannot do it. And those of you who are new here, get this idea and meditate on it. 
because this is the problem. Is Bob Landman in the room? No, it's in the doctor and can't be in the room. You see, this is what Bob doesn't understand. Giovanna, we yeah. carry this message to him. This is what Bob doesn't understand, that in order to get that spine back, he's got to get the pelvis under. If he gets the pelvis under, he's got to get the spine back. If he gets the spine back, he's got to get the shoulder blades together. They have to come together. There's no other way to get a spine back. Okay. Now, if somehow or other, we could get that so much into Bob's eyes that he would do it, we'd have it made. This is, and work with them. And because this is true, and if you doubt it, some of you juniors, you ask some of the seniors, and they'll tell you how they worked last time. Because this is true, we keep going over these premises during the first week or two, so as to reinforce your changed understandings. And what we were talking about yesterday was the fact, it seems to be a fact, certainly it is a workable hypothesis, that a body is a summation of energies. That that which we call a body in terms of energy is the summation of the energies of various areas and various organs of a body. That the organs are energies. And so the body itself becomes the algebraic sum of these various energies. And so the body, if and as and when, you can change the individual energies by virtue of freeing them or putting them into a place where they operate more clearly, etc. When this happens, you have a body which is a different, which represents or is the, is the outward and visible evidence of a different summation. Now, if you're really going to deal creatively with this material here, you have got to get yourself into a reality about this. Now, the energies, the summation that is the body, is not only a summation of those various individual energies, but is a summation of what those various individual en energies have succeeded in maintaining within the gravitational field. Because you see, as you set these together differently, as you set these small fields of energy together differently, you, begin, you can never escape from the fact that the large field of energy, which is the Earth's field, is acting on them. And that what you as an individual feel as my energy, my vitality, my being, is what is left after gravity gets through pulling these things around. Consequently, it is within this framework that you must do your changing. You cannot change gravity. You have to change the human being. Now, it is possible to abstract this situation, as I abstracted it yesterday, in terms of those blocks in terms of simpler mechanical systems which you have all dealt with and understand. But what you're really dealing with is something vastly more complicated, something which, within which there is vitality, within which there is life, within which there is response, within which there is feeling, etc., etc. So this becomes the problem that we are trying to solve. How do we reorganize that body so that it can stand and work in a gravitational field without the gravitational field breaking it down? And it can be done 
or at least a very uh, a very definite, a very marked, a very real approach to this goal can be made, as you have all seen, or you wouldn't be here. Now your keys lie in the fact that a body is a segmented unit. You have another key in the fact that there are many joints within the body that are the outward and visible signs of this segmentation. And that at each joint, there is a situation which either enhances the organization of, these, of the body within the gravitational field, or it prevents the organization of the body within the gravitational field. So that each one of these joints becomes a something to look at, becomes a something to understand in terms not of bony surfaces, but in terms of how bony surfaces are dragged by soft tissue. Obviously, if the soft tissue is around that bony joint asymmetrically, that joint is not going to work as that joint was designed to work. A man designs a hinge for a door, and one of the screws works out the hinge is not going to work as it is designed to work. And just as soon as you get something trying to work in a pattern where it was not designed to work, whether it was designed by a man or, shall we say, metaphorically a god, the same thing happens. This, the whole system breaks down. And so this is your problem. And I do not want, I am not satisfied with, I will not be satisfied with a just routine approach to it. We take a body and we do this first and we do that second and we do that third. <clears throat> it's quite true. You'll hear a lot of the word recipe flung around here, meaning that there is a route, there is a map by which you approach this. But I will not be happy if that's all you know about what you're doing. To me, it is absolutely necessary that you really think in terms of these energies within the body and the organization of them and the changing of them and what you can do with them. Because there is going to be a day when there has to be a program of research and of validation and of measurement and all of this sort of thing coming. And you cannot think in terms of first you let his arm go around and you test it. You have got to have a better understanding of how the thing fits into the general cultural patterns. So, having really firmly gotten a hold of this in your hot little hand, then it's time to go and see how can you validate it. How can you use it? How can you make use of it to change a situation which you do not like? As, for example, Frank's situation yesterday. And then the answer is that you go to the mechanism of the recipe and you follow that along. And the recipe you saw used yesterday but those of you who are juniors here, I do not think really understood the pattern. So, Don, you're being too comfortable. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell them about the pattern? Sure. Okay. <laughs> this is the pattern of the first hour now, the beginning work. That's right. The whole focus in the, well, the first hour has a double focus as every hour does. I'm going to speak about the most superficial focus, which is unwrapping the segmented plastic body that we're presented with, the body that's gotten into all kinds of hassles and hang-ups, both emotional and physical, is bent and twisted by gravity and bombardments and falling off bicycles and so forth. So the first hour is going to be to unwrap the superficial fascia on this body so that following hours can then begin to work in more depth and more specifically. Now, 
there, I'm going to switch around kind of from area to area because there are three or four things happening at once, not only the first hour but all the other hours too. In this hour, we're unwrapping superficial fascia, unwrapping the body by loosening the superficial fascia, paying specific attention to places where it's tight since that indicates greater problems underneath. And at the same time, we have our eyes and our heads kind of pointed towards the whole job of the first hour, which is to begin to get the pelvis into a more satisfactory alignment. To do this, now I'm going to backtrack again and go back to the superficial fascia. We start doing that on the upper part of the body, the thorax. We do it to... Well, may I interrupt just a minute? I don't think some of these people understand what a more satisfactory alignment of a pelvis is. Oh, okay. Other than that, I think you've been doing magnificently. <clears throat> Okay. Much better than I am. I'm going to take a couple of days off. <laughs> <laughs> the pelvis as a structure, this now includes the bone itself and the muscles and ligaments and fascia that, are, that comprise the pelvis, forms a bowl, forms the, the bottom of the vitality, if you will, of a man. And if it can't function as a bowl, then things spill out of it. If it's tipped on its side, the, the soup goes all over the stove. You've got to have it, you've got to have the stove level, you've got to have the, the bowl level on the stove. And when it's level, you can make nice soup in it and everything will come out groovy. <laughs> <laughs> You're a son of my own. <laughs> I was going to ask you to give me a tip. Yeah. 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 Flat so that it can function as a oh, basin. Yeah. The pelvis has to be horizontal. Horizontal. Yeah. As a unit, the pelvis has to be horizontal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's what we mean by proper alignment or a more satisfactory alignment. There are degrees of perfection attainable in any given series of hours, and in any biologic system, perfection isn't possible. But we try and get as close as we can. Now. To free up this pelvis, we've got to get a lot of stuff off of it from both directions. And we start by freeing the upper part of the body from the pelvis by loosening the fascia across the chest, especially the fascia which is binding the ribs down. Now this doesn't work exactly directly on freeing the pelvis, but what it does do is increase oxygen flow and cardiac output concurrently to the entire body, which makes future work a lot easier and also gives the client a sense of well-being from the first hour. The increased exchange of oxygen just makes his life a little more pleasant. This is true, but I can't agree with you that it doesn't work directly on the pelvis. It does work directly on the pelvis when you consider that after all is said and done that thorax is connected through yeah. the um, recti abdomini and through the obliques and all this sort of thing. It, the, this is the wrapping which has made, kept it immobile. And as you're opening that, that fascia, you do get a, a mobilization of this whole business. Hmm. So it does work directly on the pelvis in addition to yeah, the respiration. I see that. I was trying to make the distinction that your hands aren't in the pelvis at that moment. They're someplace else. So that's what I meant with yes. my indirect. All right. The, the right, right, right. Also, as the ribs go up, the pull on the pelvis in the front is increased. Isn't it? Well, no, it isn't as simple a mechanical system as that. This is a biological system, and whereas you can put mechanical uh, models in there in the hope of understanding your biological system more than that, nevertheless, a biological system, you move this up, that's, this moves that way, that moves that way, etc., etc. Okay. Yeah, I think the distinction is working on the front of the chest and the pelvis changes, not this and right, because right, that right, 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 they happen right, to work yes, together right yeah. because you are changing the level of energy of the of the whole body mm -hmm. you see you're adding energy to the to the chest to the thorax and in so doing you are changing the energy by way of perhaps the oxygen but how do i know by way of what you're changing the energy of the man as a whole if you down it, watch these guys as you begin to open their chest. Mm. I was watching yesterday. All right. And therefore, that energy of the man as a whole is going to be expressed 
in the pelvis, which is mm -hmm. one of the keys to the man as a whole. Yeah, I don't think it's just purely oxygen exchange. No, but that's I'm another, sure it's not. That's I'm, another paper to that be written. Much, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so let's see. Okay, we're in the process of unwrapping the body through working on the superficial fascia. The first task is to increase the oxygen exchange cardiac output and lift the thorax off the pelvis to give it a degree of mobility which will help us later <coughs> in giving it a more satisfactory alignment. We also pay, uh, in doing this task, we not only work on the thorax, we have to go out into the, in the shoulder girdle and out into the arms to free whatever uh, constraints they have placed on the thorax so that it can lift and be in its proper position. And this is ap much more apt to be necessary in the 11th hour than it is in the first. Mm -hmm. Because you see you're getting down to deeper hookups. Yeah, I think then at this point it would be important to make a comment about the kind of little dance we do around the body where we're working superficially, but every time we get a chance we take a dive for the center so that everything we're doing is really preparing, or much of what we're doing is really preparing for that big step to the center of the pelvis later. And if we're working out in the arms and maybe the 11th hour is when it's really going to do the work, nonetheless everything we can do in hour one to, to pave the way will make it easier later on. Okay. Like Dr. Rolf says, unfinished structures are like karma, they catch up with you sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> and things that are left behind are there. And I think probably those of us who had 10 and were starting yesterday got each of us got into little things that didn't get done the first time, perhaps, or weren't completed well, in some way. Well, there's something else that needs to be brought up in that connection, I think, and that is, you see, that as you be in, in those first ten hours, what you did was to uh, release, to mobilize an outer level. And as a result of that, you begin to get arising all kinds of material which had been suppressed. So that what you find found in those bodies yesterday was not what was left after those ten hours, but what re what reconstituted itself after those ten hours, mm. and uh, after the loosening of the ten hours, what reconstituted itself, and what probably is a map of how they got there in the beginning. So that what you get is a picture of a man at an earlier stage. And you very, very often get, uh, get them saying, well, uh, I have a pain now that I had when I was 20. I haven't had this pain in years. And you see, what you've done is to turn the situation back to the place where the pain was the symptom of that particular imbalance. And now you're reconstituting this particular imbalance. And this is what happens. And that's amazing. That, that simply Isn't dumbfounds that is me. amazing. It is amazing. You see, take for instance, as you brought uh, uh, Frank's ribs back and out. This is somewhere where they were shortly after his accident. Mm -hmm. And then little and little they've lost energy and they've deteriorated further and further and gone into other positions. Now they're retracing their steps. And of course some of you here who have been through other natural healing, natural methods of healing, know that osteopaths, chiropractors and so forth, have seen this same thing which they have called retracing and which they liked very much and sometimes they, for my money, overdo it every time a patient comes in with a new, new pain. They think it's a retracing pain and it may not be a retracing pain. It may be that they didn't do the job properly. They've given them a new <laughs> symptom. <laughs> but that, <laughs> I mean, not take up a little scar of war there. <laughs> Is this retracing in a reverse step? Is it yeah, yeah. It's just a ten, nine, eight, seven job instead of a seven, eight, nine, ten job. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think Dale. It's almost as if one has to take away the present pathology to recreate recreate the past pathology. I don't like that word pathology. Well, you said that was the definition of physiology gone haywire. Well, it is, but it's got to go a lot haywire before it's really pathology. Disru How about disrupted physiology? Yeah, perverted physiology. Perverted okay. physiology. Okay. Perverted physiology, because perverted physiology is what you know you can deal with. And pathology, maybe, you can deal with if you get the perverted physiology turned back. And pathology is irreversible. No, it really isn't. Such a thing as, for example, a, an emphysema is a pathology. But we can handle emphysemas very well indeed. Okay, go on. I 
get out on that limb right square on them. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> okay, we haven't mentioned the diaphragm yet as being part of the thorax. I've talked about the... No, I haven't talked about the rotation of the ribs yet either. Ribs should have four actions and we're trying to achieve them. An up and down, a fore and aft, this way. Yes, you say, where am I at? Yeah, <laughs> fore and aft, and a rotational struck function. That's like a Venetian blind. It's like a Venetian blind. Let's quote Schutz. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't really seen that concept very well yet, and I'm not sure where it fits in. All I know is that you said that, that should be there. I'm well, not, you very often to... see these four different movements coming out within the first hour, but sometimes you don't. Uh, I was going to ask whether any of you had looked at the before and after one pictures. I, I, oh, the people were done yesterday? Yeah. yeah, I did. All right, so what did you see? Well, there's a marked difference uh, in everybody's thorax. Yeah, what great kind of deal difference? Of, great deal of elevation. When um, you're talking about the elevation talking about of the el thorax. Filling. All right. How does it get that way? The ribs have to rotate. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> One of the four movements again is up and down, four and aft. Up and down. This way. Floor and aft. And aft. <laughs> and rotation around their axis. No. Well, can you stop the side if the four is coming and the aft is coming? Well, can you stop the side? Two different movements. It really is. You most of much of the time, you will find that people have a four movement but no aft movement. So it is different. And you will, if you're any good as a practitioner, and the patient's any good as a patient. You'll get your aft movement in in that first hour, but more than that, you'll get your rotation of the ribs coming in in the first hour. And this changes the test. That getting that motion is part of the general unwrapping and freeing of the thorax. It's not a, it's a specific thing in itself, and it's also a part of the larger freeing that's going on. Then we haven't talked about the bottom of the thorax, which is the diaphragm. In general, uh, we begin by freeing it along the costal margin, scraping the cleaning, I think is a better word. Sometimes it's scraping. <laughs> <laughs> Down here on the crest, it's scraping. <laughs> Somebody cleaning. hand this chair back to some of the newcomers. In general, just simply cleaning up all of the margins of the diaphragm directly where they're available, like on the costal margins, and indirectly, like where the cura go on the back, on the spinal column. That has to be done relatively in indirectly by... No, you know, in general, you don't get to that in the first hour. You get to that in the eleventh hour when you got a problem. Okay. See what I'm talking about. I'm getting my hours confused. Yeah, these people don't know about cura yet. Okay. Anyway, the diaphragm has to be freed as much as possible, the part that's available to you in the first hour to not only help with the respiratory function, but also to free the thorax so it can lift and be in a better position. I think that about covers the waterfront on the thorax. Fix it, do you remember anything else? Well, I did. I think the presentation was beautiful. Yeah, it was not a beautiful yeah. presentation. Beautiful. I think uh, the elevation of the ribs helped with the rotation of the thorax. Yeah, that's what I mean. The, the elevation and is it occurring or not occurring, I think it's a, a good guide step as to what needs to be done and when you're ready to progress from one area to another. Mm. Yeah, that's a good it's point. It's very evident. Change is occurring. There is another point that might be made in here, and that is that over and over again, people call you on the telephone. They would like to come in for an examination. <clears throat> And I say we don't give examinations, but if you want to come in for a first hour, you can, or else I don't have time to give you a first hour. If I say I don't have time to give you a first hour, well, they only want an examination. But you see, it is your behave their behavior under this kind of work that you're doing that constitutes the examination. Mm -hmm. 
this is the only thing that tells you where they are in terms of the energy level. Again, get this clear in your mind. You're doing this in terms of relationship, in terms of an energy level. You don't give a hoop if that fourth rib has come down on that fifth rib. What you give a hoop about is, is the fourth rib going to respond as you take it off, as you help it get off that fifth rib? That is what is going to constitute the diagnosis. But you can't tell them that. They can't understand that. But you better understand it yourself. And there are no bodies that don't respond. I have never seen one, and God knows I've seen thousands. <clears throat> okay, so then what do you do with a guy? So then we have to focus on the other thing that's hooked up to the pelvis, which is the lower half of the body. And again, with the focus of getting the pelvis freed up to put it in a better position, we begin to work on the legs, especially that portion of the legs which has its attachment around the head of the femur and the is ischii. Those two areas are major fo foci for us. Uh, the fascia lata, the... Well, hold it a minute. Why do you pick the head of the femur for your first work? And for the bulk of your work, really, this is well, there, I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that there are a great number of attachments of both muscles from the pelvis and muscles from the leg, which right. either insert there or across there yeah. or are around but there. But you still haven't put your finger on the nub in there. The, yeah, the, the femur is, is the rotational point that they're going right. to organize the pelvis around. That's right, and you have to free the pelvis to rotate on the femur because the femur and the leg cannot change its relation to the earth. You see, the only place that you can begin to change the relation of the body to the earth is around the head of the femur. And you're blessed by the fact that the head of the femur is the junction for all of this stuff. Now, this is a piece of velvet that God gave you as a rolfer, you see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we free the legs from the pelvis by working predominantly around the head of the femur and with the hamstrings. In order that we then can go directly to the pelvis and give it its first taste of alignment, which is the pelvic lift that you saw going on yesterday. Uh, I'd like you to expand on the word alignment there. Its first taste of alignment. What do you mean? Alignment, by alignment I mean not only giving it as much horizontality as we can at this yeah. point, also alignment by dropping the lumbar spine back as much as possible in this first hour, so that the lumbar begins to take up its job of weight bearing, which in many people it has lost because of its anterior displacement. So I see alignment not only on the horizontal, but also letting the lumbars drop back in place so that they can begin to do their work and then free up other misalignments. Yeah, well you see, later. you're once again into the, into the relation business, the importance of relationship. You can't get horizontality except as it's related to a verticality. Yeah, so and the lumbars have to go back. The lumbars have to go back. There is no other way to do it. And just as soon, just as long as the lumbars are way forward, you get the joint of the fifth lumbar and the sacrum uh, not incompetent, relatively incompetent, to do the job that they're lined up for. Did Bill take our skeleton back? No, it's in the other room. Let's get it. Eddie? That, that's a good thought. Yeah, she has about the worst pelvis I've ever seen. The worst seen. anterior going. <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> it's so bad that you can't tell whether it's a she or a he. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> right. So, okay. What we have done, the goal of the first hour, 
the goal of the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth hours is to make that pelvis, is to organize that pelvis so that it knows where the horizontal is. The remainder of the work that we did in the first hour then is has again a double function the work in the neck and going down the back it's to give yeah the but wait wait a while wait and let them, them let them really see how that works you or let's go up there and talk to that pelvis in a way that he she it understands I think everybody can see, no matter where you're sitting, that the flat surface of this interspace between the last lumbar and the first sacral is on a plane which is roughly like this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's about like that. And what we want to do is bring it as much as we can to this kind of a thing. Now, as Dr. Roth mentioned, the ground is fixed. We can't do anything about that. So with the weight transmitted through the bony structures, the first place that we can do any rotation is right there at the head of the femur. So the whole task is to free this structure off the pelvis, free these ligaments and attachments as much as possible to get let us get the rotation, and then with the pelvic lift, to begin to rock these back and let the pelvis turn Put your hand there in the same position that you would do with the pelvic lift. That's right. This. And to begin to actually rock it, pull it down, let the lumbar And you see back. when that skeleton does his own voluntary bringing of his, of, his, of his lumbars back, then you begin to get lengthening between the individual lumbars. And you very often feel how the sacrum will reorganize itself on the fifth lumbar. And this is what happened yesterday with Frank when uh, Don here became quite lyrical about how differently his uh, whole lower half was feeling. Yeah, that was far That enough. was quite <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, now you still have a problem in that body. You have gotten the ribs, the thorax to climb up off the pelvis. You've gotten the legs to free themselves down off the pelvis. You have taken the pelvis and made it as horizontal as you can. But you still have a problem in that body in that you have not changed the cervical organization. Now, those of you who have worked with manipulative methods before know that you do not get that the cervical curve and the lumbar curve these secondary curves are related that your cervical curve talks about your lumbar curve that your lumbar curve talks about your cervical curve therefore if you aim to change the one or the other permanently you have to change the twin, the two ends of the stick. Uh, the anatomy books, the physiology books, talk about these curves being secondary curves. But I have yet to see any anatomy book or physiology book really discussing the necessity of balance between the cervical and the lumbars. But this is so, and this is obvious to you as you start working with bodies. And so here, in order to complete the work of a generalized reorganization of that body, you now have to go up to the cervical spine. And remembering that you are doing once over lightly in that first hour, you are dealing primarily with superficial fascia. You are not dealing with individual muscles. 
you cannot get to individual muscles in the first hour. Remembering this, you realize that you cannot deal with anything in the neck in that first hour really, except the spine of the, the enwrapping of the sternocleidomastoid or the enwrapping of the uh, trapezius. Now it is these two muscles which most superficially have held the cervical area where it has been held to balance the lumbar. And it is these two muscles, the releasing of which will permit the area to go back and balance your new muscle, your new lumbar. And you see the difference between this method as a method and all other manipulative methods that I know of is the following, that you do not let an individual get away from the mat until you have done the best you can to integrate him, hence comes the name, to integrate him each time you work on him. Consequently, it would be completely out of order to do your first hour without doing a pelvic lift to try to organize a pelvis, without doing something to balance the change in the lower part with the upper part, without making the man or attempting to make the man conscious of the fact that he is going into a new alignment. This business of simply taking your hands and manipulating this is not what it is about. What it is about is making the individual conscious of the fact that there are relations within his body which make him feel best. And it is his responsibility to move himself along toward those places. It is his responsibility to start getting an awareness of where is the top of his head and where is his waistline, in other words, his first or second lumbar, to move them back. So that as the man goes into this new relationship, he begins, he begins to try at least to make it possible for him to get a changed pattern of movement. Not merely a changed pattern, but a more integrated pattern of movement. Anybody and everybody can put hands into a body and change a body. And have mercy, good Lord, on you if you come and say to me, well, I know I did a good job because I changed the body. <clears throat> All you have to do is to get your fists into somebody. You change that body. And you can change it very unhappily. You can take it. It's just as easy to take a body apart. In fact, it's a lot easier than it is to put it together. But the reason you call yourself a worker in structural integration is because you put it together. And if you don't put it together, <laughs> you're not, you're doing something else. You're not doing what is being taught here. It's very, very important to realize that. It's very, very important to realize that the first law of manipulation as we teach it here is to get the materials of the structure into the direction, the muscles, the units, whatever it is, unit you're dealing with, toward the place that is the place where normally it was designed to work. Because the problems in bodies arise because units of that, uh, parts of that body, organizations within that body, get out, get away from the place where the design calls for their working. And it doesn't require a great deal of outness. An eighth of an inch will do it. And you no longer have possible the energy pattern, which is the most economical energy pattern. Now you have a new pattern. And while the man is young and vigorous, he can handle it. He can take his vital energy, and he can force himself to do this, that, and the other thing. But as he gets older and he loses some of this vital energy, he can no longer force himself as satisfactorily to him. And a little and a little, that body begins to break down until all of a sudden it comes to a crisis and then it breaks down a lot. 
Because you see, you do not have the reciprocity of pull, the reciprocity of energy field activity, which makes it possible for it to spontaneously come up, restore itself. So that your first law, your first manipulative law, is to take the structure and bring it toward the position which it normally should occupy. And I don't say which it averagely should occupy. Which it normally should occupy, which it's designed to occupy. Which an examination of the skeleton and the physiology of the, in, of the human say it has to occupy if it's going to work best, work most easily. Work with least energy expenditure. You bring it into that direction and you demand physiological movement. Now, in working in that first hour, as you worked on the thorax over and over again, we said, that's right, breathe, please. Take another breath, please. This is physiological movement for the thorax. And while you are holding that fascial sheath in the position in which, or toward the position where it should be, ideally speaking, you are demanding physiological movement, in this case, breath. When you get into the arms, as you are holding it, as you are holding the restrictions in the upper arm, you are demanding physiological movement of the arm. And what is the physiological movement? There you have a big motor pattern that goes out from the elbow. And the same is true with the leg, etc., etc. You cannot reorganize a body with your hands. You can only help that body to reorganize itself through movement. Now this is the basic difference in concept between what you are going into here and the other much more orthodox manipulative techniques. Their assumption is that they can replace something that has been displaced. You can, but you can't make it work there. He has to make it work there. And as you go around Esalen, a lot of people are going to pitch to you a nice little negative of, oh well, I want something that I can do myself. And then you get them in here on the floor, and they lie like a cloud of dirt waiting for you to do something for them. This is a system which demands the participation of the individual who is being worked on. For best results. Obviously, if you're working on a deaf and dumb <laughs> three-year-old, you're not going to get very much participation. And you can do a lot of other. But this isn't what you are taking on, I don't think, most of you. Obviously, if you're working on those little, on that brain injured child, this picture I showed you yesterday, you have to do it, most of it. But this isn't, this isn't the trip we're on right here, right now. So, who hasn't got an idea, who hasn't got a clear idea of what's going on in the first hour? My goodness. I'm really teaching well. Ida, that's all. I that's have done. one question. Good. Did you finish the legs when you were talking? Of course not. You weren't interested in finishing the legs. No. You were interested did you in making... what you were going to say about the legs? Oh, did yeah. I finish what I was going to say about the legs? We left out the hamstrings. Yeah, no. we left out the hamstrings. That's I mentioned that we ran out the hamstrings. Yeah. 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 You see, in that first hour, <laughs> we're not dealing with legs as legs. We're only dealing with legs as anchorages of the pelvis. So that your interest is really basically only at the head of the finger and what attaches, and at the ischial tuberosity and what attaches. You are interested in starting that pelvis on its way. Yesterday you said that Sharon's lumbar spine was anterior. What did you mean by that? 
was anterior that that was yeah, in. Yeah, that it was curved sure, anteriorly. Sure, curved by. anteriorly. Yeah. I wasn't sure that I understood that. Yeah. Uh, back is, in theory, a normal position for the lumbar. But in our fact, it shouldn't be anything like as far anterior as, as Sharon's lumbar was. I'm going to stop here. No, I should. Uh, it be uh, unreachable. I mean, there should be no part of that spine which you can't reach in your own, by your own voluntary will and say, come on back. Well, Plumba, I want you to come back and you can get it back. Etc. Etc. Now, it's now quarter past ten. We have considerable, some time that needs to be spent getting uh, data on uh, Bob Striver over there, photographs, etc. Will somebody take that on? And maybe we'll improve the shining moments with coffee, though I would rather get the first hour done, but in as much as we have to get photographs and so forth. We For work. And they're thinking of putting in raw work as one of the elements. But what they want first, and I don't blame them, is, is a statement of what is already, you know, what has been demonstrated. And in order to get this convocation of MDs together, they've got to have something like the actual statement of what Julian has to offer there. This is understandable. So that all of this is, is what is keeping me sitting on pins and needles. He doesn't have a blood chemistry report, does he? Of course he does. He does. Yes, he does. This is, as I say, what's making me foam at the mouth. I thought Beverly said that too. Well, Beverly isn't aware of this, but he does. He does indeed, he does. I have a feeling that if just the transcription of the tape would probably irk some of the MDs more than, yeah, more than sort of anything. Your curiosity yeah, I know. Well, I realize all this, and I'm not interested in sending just that. I'm interested in getting the whole bit. Now, Julian said to me a month ago, I've got so much stuff here, I'm going to turn out two, three papers in two weeks. He says, you don't know how fast I can turn these papers out. Well, I know what's the matter with the guy. Seventeen more people are sticking pins into him, and the people that are nearest with the sharpest pins get the first attention. I understand this. It happens to me, too. But part of the thing is that he doesn't have put data. She hasn't... Uh... So that was set that up have... long ago. This whole kerfluffle we went through last spring. Yes, he has a blood chemistry report. I got it on right on paper. Then he'll talk into a tape recorder. Well, I don't know whether you... You got a contract. <laughs> uh, you photographers, please hustle along. We're very late. Huh? What are you letting look at? Well, he's not talking into the... Well, he's, he's not going to give you the actual data. Because a lot of it is, is brain, brain stuff. No, but I mean blood chemistry. He has the blood chemistry, period. Yeah, I'll be glad to look at it. He has the blood chemistry, and he has made the, made the connections and the interpretations in his own mind of what this blood chemistry showed. And then you see, he sent that blood chemistry to the to the computer up there in uh, what's Sacramento, and it was away for six weeks, two months, God knows what. In the meantime, day after day, I called Julian. Uh, and nothing happens, nothing happens. And a lot of that didn't really have to do with Julian. It had to do with Sacramento. But I can't call Sacramento. They never heard of me. Or if they did, they heard of what me. What is it in Sacramento? A computer. The state. 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 Yeah. State. 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 You can imagine why it took so long. <laughs> this is what all the kerfuffle is about. Oh. Nothing has come together. Everything is around the edges, including the hunt data. My husband works for the state. Public house. Would you like me able to do it? Would you think he might? Yeah, I think so. Well, we have got to get this stuff together. Not that it makes any difference to the people that are in this room now, with the exception of Bill William. Mm -hmm. But you see, it is the opportunity for expansion here. And they're going to put in several new departments over there in uh, Albuquerque, as I hear. And they are considering putting in a rocker in there as the head of a department. Now, this would be a great, big, beautiful break. And in the meantime, we can't get what it takes to apply for the job, so to speak. Does me have the details? 
And Lee, Lee have a detail? Yeah, about what it is, and I can talk to them for my husband. I have the Who has the detail? Oh, you have one. talking about? No, no, about the, no. About the, no. the uh, about computer data. About the computer problem. Yeah. Yeah. Julian has that. Imagine. Whoever has the data, the, the printout data has it. There's no, there's nothing else you can get. No, but, but I mean, I'm making the sense, making sense out of the data that's there. If it's the correlation stuff, of right, the data that yeah, has to be done. Yeah, what does this mean? It's all there. Yeah. So like, but you have to organize it yeah. and make sense out exactly. of it. And it's not yeah. the computer stuff that has to be made sense out of it. Julian yeah. has to sit down and say, okay, you know, yeah, this has, has to be in relation to that. He hasn't got any results mm -hmm. about friendly. Uh, not from now on, about the, uh, about the body. Somewhere in this house, yeah. I have a small tape recorder. Yeah. This size. It's in a box that's that size. You know where it is. Break it out and let's see whether it works. Uh, let Don take a look at it. Oh, there, I don't get my screen again. Uh, <laughs> now, you photographers, you are due in here at 9 o'clock so that by this time, which is now 9.21, we have all those pictures taken and posted. You're the first ones. I hate to tell you, but you're on duty at 9 o'clock. You see, if we dawdle around this way and we get going at 9.30, we don't get done at night till half an hour later. Amen. Amen. Now, let's get back. Uh, here present do not feel secure in that first hour the understanding of it the background of it etc well of course you don't have to you, all you need is the ideas all you need is the ideas have you got them yeah. both of you mark what do you know about the ideas well, one of the, the basics of the idea is, is that um, the, a major thing about the Roth technique is it's, it leads toward the freeing of the pelvis. And the first hour um, begins this process by freeing the breathing, first of all, which is a necessary thing in order to really free the body at all. And there's freeing of the breathing and freeing of uh, structures attached to the pelvis, which would help to bind it. For example, the chest in its own way helps to bind the pelvis, and the arms in its own way, since they're um, merely appendages of the thorax. And then um, the other major place worked on is the, uh, the femur, the top of the femur, which the helps his attachment to the lower limb, of course. And since, uh, it's hard to describe, since the pelvis is sort of like a basic block within the body somehow, and it can't be freed of itself, you have to free the things which attach to it. And that's one of the major, that's basically the major objective of the first time. I wouldn't exactly say that, but uh, you, what you have latched on to is the how to do it. But that isn't the objective of the first hour, really. Uh, would you like to take that and amend it, Fritz? I'd say the first hour is involved more with the fascial layers, which are the, the outer wrapping of the body. And as you uh, approach the body and approach the superficial fascia, then uh, you are able to, uh, Dr. Rolf used the analogy of an onion, uh, we can take off one layer at a time, getting deeper down towards the pelvis and to horizontalize the pelvis. And the superficial fascia is like the, you know, the top layer of the onion, or the paper layer, and this is the first layer you have to deal with. Uh, so I say this is the emphasis of the first album, is on the fascial layers. And as you've indicated, you're aiming indirectly at the pelvis, but in the first hour, the... But he hasn't really aimed at the first hour. Right, that, that's not the first that's hour right. the problem. It's the fascial layers. The, the ten hours is aiming at the pelvis. first hour is aiming at... Would you also like to correct an absolute misstatement from our point of view that he made? The breathing, uh, mm. I thought, was a, a 
that the in freeing the chest, you can improve the breathing. Uh, and this kind of goes along with raising the chest and changing the structure. I think this is the structural change to me, which is the basic thing you're aiming at. And the breathing in the physiology helps tremendously when you're doing this to, to raise the chest, raise the ribcage off of the lower trunk. So it's a structural change that you're looking at rather than doing this because of the breathing. While we're talking about breathing, Fritz, uh, would you also like to put in a, sh a small discussion about the other function of breathing which everybody here experienced yesterday afternoon? The excretory function of breathing. <coughs> Certainly it is one of the prime um, organs of excretion. The bowels, the urine, and the breathing, and the skin. The skin is another trans organ. I think it's the four basic areas of excretion. And certainly improving the ventilation, you are improving the ability of uh, the organ metabolism in this way. That you well, it isn't only that you're improving the, the capacity for it, but that actually you are there is a very great, big, immense, big excretory function going on in the first hour as a result of that respiration. And you all were aware when I was complaining yesterday about how Owen was being subjected to this excretory flood and flow, and it, it, it becomes a very major problem. And this is something that you people should know about in the sense that you're expecting to be uh, practitioners yourself. Especially in the first hour, this excretory function is overwhelming. And you people need to be aware of this, and you need to be aware of the fact that very often you have to handle the situation in such a way that you're not going to be overwhelmed by it. Uh, there, is there was another complete misstatement that Mark just made when he talked about arms being the appendages to the chest. Are they? Oh, no, no, not in no, that sense exactly. at all. It's a, it's a girdle, a yoke, where the arms and shoulders are riding on the thoracic cage. And, and the use of the appendage is, it is not a, a direct extension of the trunk out. There's a structure set on the trunk which can function independently, if you would, of the central part of the body. It's more of a yoke than it is a true outgrowth. This is also true of the legs. And uh, this uh, talks to you about, I mean, it, 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 in the nomenclature about the body, the pelvic girdle, and the shoulder girdle tell you that these are not appendages at all. They're entirely different structures. And what I'm underscoring at this point is the fact that you have got to learn to look at the body in a different way. If you're going to look at it in the same old way, you're going to get the same old answers. These answers have been thoroughly unsatisfactory. No, not thoroughly unsatisfactory. But at any rate, at this point, you people are looking for different and more answers. And in order to get different and more answers, you have to ask different questions. Uh, Peter Levine, would you make a contribution as to what you heard in the first hour discussions and how your mind would carry on with that? Because you've got some different and interesting ideas, and I think that the to rest me, of you should hear it. One of the, of course, the critical the critical point is the, that the manipulation is doing something to change the superficial fascia. Now the fascia, as Dr. Rolf said in the beginning, what we're dealing with is a system of energies. When the body moves, when someone walks, we see the reflection of a multitude of energy sources, of energy oscillators, if you like. Um, like a weight on a spring, bouncing up and down, has a certain energy. And you can see this in a person when they walk. You can see whether a person has energy or whether a person is dead. Um, now, the element that connects and couples all of these energy sources probably has a good deal to do with the fascia, and probably the superficial fascia in particular. So in the first session, I think, um, 
the, the subjective feeling is that, the, that before the first session, the subjective fascia is very inflexible, is uh, wooden, metallic almost. Uh, and if you have a substance like this, coupling all of these energy sources, they can't possibly come together. They can't possibly function together. Because a highly damp substance doesn't transmit energy. It absorbs it. And if there's going to be any coupling between these energy sources, the path of coupling has to be made more elastic. Or else the energy will be lost, no matter what else is done. So if the energy can't flow, there's no sense in going on. So I have a feeling, or an intuition, that one of the important things that's going on is that there's a change in the superficial fascia that allows for energy to flow throughout the body. And then, as the deeper muscles are being worked on, that is to say, the individual energy sources, that now they can be integrated by this new structure which is elastic plastic and not damped out and lost and deadened by a fashion which cannot transmit energy. And anyhow, I, I don't know, I, this is a concept that, that sort of just gelled in my mind in the last few days and uh, helps me a little bit to understand the structure. That's, that's really a beautiful presentation and I thank you. You've added some, a very definite contribution to our thinking around here. Thank you. Now let me throw in a little something into this pot of stew. Uh, as you know, colloids, all colloids, are uh, exist either as sols or gels. gels. A gel is, as you know, semi-solid. A sol becomes more fluid and flow is greater. You get from a gel to a sol by the addition of energy. Whether you add it in the form of heat or whether you add it in terms of any other type of energy source, you get from a gel to a sol by the addition of energy. Now, my suspicion is, you see, adding to your suspicion, that what is going on in that first hour is that you are adding and adding mechanical energy to the gel of the fascia, the superficial fascia, thereby getting a sol whose properties of conduction, etc., are different. How do you like that? I think, I think, you know, a priori, that's the most likely possibility. Because at least that's one transformation we understand. Yeah. It's simple-minded, so to speak. Yeah. Which is the, always the best place to start. Well, you got to start somewhere. And I think, I think the, the route for going about this, and this is, we can, I think we can make measurements on these changes just from considering a model, you know, uh, connecting the joints, say, with, with springs and motors and so forth, and then making a model of the fascia and seeing the numbers, we can actually get numbers and see the coupling constants, the elasticity is, we would predict be changing this much. And that at least would give us a ballpark. We would say, well, we can look then for solid gel transformations and so forth. Well, we could if we had somebody to make the model, Peter. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there, there might be an even simpler way than making the model because you're going to get into so many the spatial arrangement of making the model is going to be tremendously complex. Sure. You could run a vector analysis and run that through a computer. Oh, you could probably, yeah. you would certainly use a, so you'd use a Fourier analysis anyhow, which yeah. is a vector thing. Oh yeah, I mean that's the kind of model, it would be an infinite model essentially. But I, I mean that's getting technical. I don't think you'll need to do that since Dr. Kehler back in the 20s working at Stanford has written about seven papers on this very subject of physical constraints interrupting universal processes and how they limit the system and he refers to three other physicists who are working on this problem and the papers are available there's about seven of them yeah. over this very subject of, of what you're saying about the physical constraint of fascia limiting the process of energy flow in the body i have to see those i don't know those papers wolfgang kohler uh, the, the 19 
The psychologist. The psychologist. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He was on this in the twenties. Well, that's for sure something to look up. Yeah. To see what he did. And again, these are these are things that eventually could be done, ex you know, experimentally, mm -hmm. directly on animal subjects. He did them in terms of perception more than in terms of the motion of the body. Oh, However, I see. You're talking the more thing. of the Gestalt kind of feels that he was. Yeah. yeah. The Gestalt. The, Gestalt phenomena that he first described. But with, with Dr. Ralph is saying that it's important for us to find out eventually the physiochemistry. What I'm saying is that he refers to three physicists who have written papers about the physiochemistry. Okay. I mean, the references are there available. Yeah, I'll for sure look that up. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I think we'll save you a bit of time. Sure. Stretching. Sure. Now, this discussion this morning. Those of you who heard the discussion on the second morning, last seminar, realize how different this has been. And yet it has very definitely, I think, added to the concepts that are available to you. Uh, and this is the way it goes here. It's very interesting to watch the growing edges of this thing. And it sure, it is not necessary that we solve these problems in order to be uh, fairly good Rolfers. But it is necessary that we solve these problems if we're going to go on and really understand more about human personalities. And it just depends on where we want to fit ourselves. Do we want to be a bunch of mechanics who are doing a very good mechanical job, or do we want to uh, extend the limits of information? And I think you all know where I would stand on that. It's, you, people have to use your gifts in the directions in which you have. There's, you know, this point, uh, I think, in, in science, and certainly in, you know, in psychiatry, in establishment psychiatry, the gen even, even the, the, the biochemical view is dealing strictly with things that are going on in the mind. And exactly, if we could find out more, for example, of you know what these energy sources were in the body, then, and we know that the that you can't separate the mind and the body, that it makes no sense mm. that you're mm. dead as soon as you do that. That we also have to be looking, you know, for pharmacological approaches on body levels and so forth. Well, you see, by the concept that we have just outlined here, Peter, we have a mechanics whereby we can understand more of the, of the biochemical changes that are going on at that deep cellular level. Because what we are actually saying, you see, is that we are literally adding energy to the fascia. Now we will be having a tissue which is operational on a different energy level and which can therefore and thereby contribute to a changed uh, chemistry which gives us uh, an entirely different chemical groundwork for operations. But we can always ask the question, why is it that one person responds better than another to this manipulation? All right, I'm Do they have a deficiency? That's right. Something? I'm and thoroughly agreeing important. with this. I'm thoroughly agreeing with this. But when we ask that question too loud, we settle <coughs> back and say, well, this is a situation that I can't deal with it's too far along, or it's missing, or something. And I fight all the way, every step of the way, when I see any of you people uh, loafing behind that rationalization. Now, I'm perfectly free to confess that there are situations that I certainly don't expect to, quote, cure. I certainly don't expect on... Uh, uh, Frank here, who will be in shortly, I certainly don't expect that the day is ever going to come when we are going to be able to get that man into a shape where he can dispense with his capitalization. But I certainly do expect that that man is going to be operational on a very different level of energy. I expect that his attitudes are going to change and that these deficiencies of his, which loom very large in his mind right now, are going to settle back and no longer annoy him psychologically, as they do now. 
as a result of the different chemical level that he will be operating on. Now, this is the addition that I want us to be able to put into the therapeutic concept. The guy will be thinking differently by, by virtue of the different energy level that the energy with that is within that body expresses itself in a different level of thinking as well as a different level of doing as well as an ease of handling as well as a an ease in doing what Don expressed here is five hours work in two hours but in addition to that it's what's going on up here in terms of hopefulness in terms of optimism in terms of easiness, in terms of a sense of I can do it, in terms of a sense of this doesn't matter to me, but I can do that. All of this stuff. And you see, we have given lip service, many people in the culture, in the therapeutic culture, have given lip service to such an idea. But I really and honestly do not know of any workers who are immersed, identified with this idea, thinking in these terms. They are always thinking to outside of themselves. They talk about it. It's in their head. But they haven't identified with the concept so that they're really going through riding on that concept. That's the thing that Hans Selye says in his right. uh, autobiography. He says, you can't do any science until you feel it in your whole body. Well, this is right. And you see, the therapeutic community is not feeling it. It's doing it. And this is what I want to this is what I would like us to be able to escape from. And this is why I keep nagging and nagging and nagging about this understanding of energy and this understanding of relationship. That's not gonna happen until they're elbowed, you know, literally and figuratively. Don't you believe it's not gonna happen? It's gonna happen. Until they're elbowed. <laughs> anyway. It is urgently important that you people see that that whole first hour bit, which you will presently understand is really an abstraction of the whole 10 hour bit. Very little that's going to be done in the 10 hours that hasn't been foreshadowed in this first hour. But that you begin to see that you are dealing with the man as a whole that the man as a whole can almost be mathematically expressed in terms of energy. And that it is this figure that expresses the man that we're dealing with in this first hour. in that first hour through what I believe is a change of energy of the entire human being which in turn if we had the money and we had the devoted people could literally Mac be explored in terms of a change in the actual biochemistry of that body at the beginning of the first hour and the end of the first hour we have done this we did it 20 years ago nobody has listened to it Nobody will listen to it. If I published it, if I managed to publish it today, they still would look at it and say, oh, well, that's old stuff. It was done by the old measurements. Therefore, not, let's not look at it. You see, always this, this necessary repetition, repetition on a higher level. So that at this particular level, we are going to have to repeat it. But I know that it happens because I saw the whole thing gone through 20 years ago. Well, 15, certainly. And so you would find that every human be every one of the human beings in this class that was worked on yesterday would be showing you different cellular chemistry. As a result of that first hour, which was really dealing with the man as a whole. Now then, having done this and having literally kicked the guy upstairs. Now we have to organize him so that he can live upstairs. 
And again, we don't, we may not, we are not permitted ever to forget that we have a man here operating in a gravitational field. So that we have to look at how the man is organized within that gravitational field. You see, in that first hour, in spite of what I've just said to you, you have done something to the guy. You have literally added energy through your elbow, through your fist, through your hands, and sometimes through your words, as you made him understand differently. You have done a lot of draining off of toxic material in that first hour. There's no question of it. You have done a lot of putting in of oxygen in that first hour. There's no question of it. And it is because you have put in that additional oxygen that the man is now operating on a higher chemical level. Because as most of you are aware, the oxygenated compounds are compounds of a greater energy level. As you take away, and you should have looked at those pictures and seen what you saw, what you are able to see. At this level, you begin to see that the man is sliding in terms of his contour, off that beautiful contour that he had yesterday. Speaking of contour, when they took my pictures afterwards, they came around and he put my head up afterwards, and I resented this that I should have stood and able to stand the same as I did in the first you picture. You could have stood the same oh, as I, you, you I, did in the first picture, but let me tell you something. In the first picture, you were not able to stand with no, your head up. Okay, but I should have been able to keep it up without somebody saying and telling me where to put it. No, you shouldn't have been. Not no, necessarily. No, because this alters the picture. No, it doesn't. You just sit back and settle back and stay a while and you'll <laughs> get some of these ideas. I admit that this is a complaint that very often comes up from the lay person. It has no business to come up in the class because here we would like you to realize the fact that what we're doing is asking you to explore. We're not only asking you to explore what you are now able to do that you weren't able to do before, but we are in the process of training you to be aware of lines, which in the beginning you wouldn't have been able to feel at all. This, this is may, part of our this, training this, program. This, this may be so. Well, I would like to have seen him try to place me before in the same position. Then. He couldn't have done it, and we cannot waste, and you will not be able to waste that much time on an individual when you're working with him. You have one hour to get through that man, and when you take half of that hour trying to talk to him and tell him, now, put your head up, and he does this, and he does that, and he does that, and he does that, and he does that, and he can't feel his head up because he hasn't got the mechanism. You have then shortened your available time for therapy to a place where you can't get it done. So all of these practical details you will learn in the course, I hope, in the course of this, these 10 hours. But uh, in that second hour, you are going to see that those unregenerate legs from the knees down, those unregenerate legs are now demanding compensation from the regenerate part of the body, the regenerated part of the body. And so now you have to go along and start regenerating the legs to take the strain off the rest. Some bright boy one time said that the whole of the Rolf technique consists in uh, decompensating the compensations. And in the slang of yesteryear, when he said that, he said a mouthful. This is almost literally what you're doing. You're going after one compensation after the other. You are getting the most superficial, which are probably late compensations first. And you're turning back the picture, as I said yesterday. And as you turn back the picture, you're out to get symptoms. That had been the symptoms of that old level of compensation. It's as simple as that. So today we have to finish the superficial fascia, which after all does run from the knees down and around the feet. Anybody?
anybody like to suggest why we didn't even try to do that yesterday? Yeah, I'd like to work on it. I think one the most practical reason is there's just so much you can do in an hour, and so much any individual can take in an hour. That is the reason. <laughs> it's just it's just a question of time. It's of, not a question of time. It's a question what you of can handle. Handle. what you can yeah. handle. As both as the operator and as the yeah. Operator. Now, as you go on in these second hours, you'll find several of these people will give you almost as much brouhaha as we got in some of those first hours. Because they're really finishing the first hour. Yeah. So well, yes, um, because we because and because. Let's not because too much. Uh, but that is the reason they can't handle all that at once. And if they could, it would be logical, of course, to go through the whole body. Isn't it also because the lower legs and the feet have to bear the brunt? Uh, I mean, the compens the, they literally have to bear the burden of the compensations. I don't know that they do always. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking in terms of, we don't have one in this class, do we? Uh, you remember some of those people we had with those spindle legs, but the compensation was all up here. <laughs> Who was that? Bill and I. So, no, it was some <laughs> great, <laughs> no, it was some great big guy. Julian has been the ones in the big Yeah, but Jay well, haven't Lloyd seen Julian. Kind of that way. Yes, Lloyd would have Jimmy, been one of them. Jimmy Johnson? Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Jimmy Johnson. Uh, Jimmy Johnson had a cause in his leg, and the compensation's up here. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't you see it that way? Mm -hmm. Jimmy Johnson was the man I was really thinking of, and so it, oddly enough, I didn't... I didn't sketch him in black. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this time round, we're going to have to finish up this quote once over, lightly. <laughs> now, I will not continue with this discussion until you have taken the before two pictures and come to some conclusions. I am not going to hand it to you on a platter, because if I do, you'll forget it. Yeah, late today. <laughs> <laughs> we can't all get together. She, must have been in <laughs> she was in the room all right. Only she figured that she was early yesterday, so <laughs> you see, it goes like this. <laughs> now. So we talked, we talked in the first hour about the general, uh, idea, the general idea of energy fields and of integrating them. Is there anyone in this room to whom the idea of an energy field around an organ, an individual organ, is a strange idea? <laughs> of all people. Who else? I'm not saying I don't buy it. I understand. <laughs> but uh, I personally do not think that it is an idea which is in orthodox or acceptable medicine. It is in, it certainly is not, hmm? it is in unorthodox medicine. And maybe some of you know that, and maybe you know something of the history of it, and if you don't, I'll quickly fill you in because I think it's important to know where these things stem from. How many of you know who Abrams was? Oh my Lord. Carl? The guy that invented, the guy that discovered, the guy that applied radionic medicine. I don't think he was Paul Abrams. <laughs> anyway, he was a guy, he was a guy that lived up in uh, San Francisco. And the precise history of his discovery, I don't really know. But this thing went on, I would say, oh, before 1920 and after 1910 the second decade of this century. 
this man was a way out left guy. <clears throat> and he probably had the idea that there were in there were energy fields that indicated certain organs. That there were numbers that indicated fields that indicated certain organs. Thus, a liver, for example, he said, was represented by a wavelength of so and so many micrometers, millimeters. And he devised a something which came to be known in the in the were in the mouths of its friends and of its enemies as the black box. He put together a, a, a machine, if you like, uh, in which he was able to detect the resonance of fields of certain lengths. It was an electronic device. Whether his really plugged into the electric circuit or not, I don't remember. There were those that did, there were those that didn't. There were many variations made on this, and these variations were made between the years of, oh, I'd say 1915 and 1945, maybe. 1945, they were being persecuted fairly heavily. Uh, this worked this way. You took a sample from a given person. It could be a sample of hair, it could be a sample of urine, it could be a sample of blood. And irrespective of whether that person was near or far, and this was what pitched him in almost into jail, you put the sa you mounted the sample in front of your machine. There was a little funny leather or rubber plate down here, and you did this with the rubber plate. And you turned the knob of your machine, presumably to give you a different wavelength. And when you got to a certain place on that, uh, dial, your finger stuck. Didn't stick hard and fast, but there was just a very definite change. If you could use the machine, not all people could. And then you looked at the dial, and the dial said 875, and this was a, uh, a figure which indicated the field for the liver, and this was out of order. And it didn't tell you what was wrong with it, it simply told you that it was operating on the wrong wavelength. And after that, there were various things that could be done. Many of the chiropractors used chiropractic treatment. Some people who, used, who knew how to use homeopathy put in homeopathic remedies by putting them onto the plate and going over the, reversing the process, doing the same thing backward. Very interesting things happened. Very interesting things happened. The homeopathic medicine job, for instance, which you would be able to get a wavelength on before you did your reversing. You could no longer get a wavelength on after you did your reversing. Some virtue, in quotes, had gone out of this homeopathic medicine. The commonest way of using these machines was to reverse the flow of them so that you were, as they said, broadcasting the wavelength to the individual, and his sample was still set in front of the box. And this seemed to, in many cases, I will do more than that, I'll say did, give them a great deal of help. Many cases, some cases not. Surprising. Now this went on over a period of years. Those boxes were built, and they were built uh, Oh, tremendous number of them. There were four or five different groups that built them, and they all had salesmen on the road. And they all went out, and they all sold them to chiropractors. And these chiropractors all bought them, and only about half of them could use them. Uh, this went throughout this country and throughout Canada. And practically every chiropractor in the two countries had these machines. And as I say, only a few could use them. Then the next thing that happened, somebody who was interested in invalidating this proposition went up to Canada one day, and while a chiropractor was out, he took all the innards out of the machine. And the chiropractor came home, and he worked his machine for Mrs. Jones, 
and he got the answer all right. <laughs> and now, <laughs> that was really in the fire. But you see, what really happened was that the man was using psychic methods. The operator was in the circuit with the machine, and he was detecting what was going on. So, I have told it like it is. Uh, after this debacle, all kinds of things happened. In just about every state of the Union, the officials got after the owners of these machines and confiscated them. Uh, some of them went to, some of the chiropractors went to jail for their, quote, rights to use it. Some of the chiropractors put it in the darkest cupboard in the place and got their wives simply crazy because now she had no clothes closet anymore. Some of them put it out in the barn and still continued to use them. Many of those chiropractors were threat or and osteopaths, no MDs that I have ever met, were threatened uh, with having their licenses taken away if they continued, etc., etc. And it was the whole trip, and all of this was going on in the 1940s and the 1950s. And by and by, the whole lot of them got to the place where they figured it was just too much trouble, and the whole thing died out. Now, I am bringing this up only and merely to say to you that if you are willing to accept far out evidence, there is a certain amount of evidence here. There was also another machine on the market that measured the energy of certain organs by putting electrodes on top of the skin. What was the name? Microdynamometer. That's right, microdynamometer. Now, this also was a machine which was not accepted by the medics, and for a very good reason. This was an honest machine. I mean, it had nothing to do with plugging in the operator. Yes, it did, in the sense that you got different indications of the value of a liver, let's say, by putting the uh, electrode, was an electrode? Yeah, it must have been, on top of the liver. But now the thing is outside the skin and it's outside certain layers of fat, and it's outside certain um, tissues full of water and so forth. And you would get a variable reading in accordance with, did you do make the reading or did you make the reading? You see, you would have pressed differently on the machine, on the electrode, so that it was not reliable in that sense. However, it did show, if you're inclined to go out on limbs, it did show very definitely that you got different readings and different energies uh, on, on, over various organs on the skin. <clears throat> Actually, you could, I have in a Texas class, had some one person measuring this thing right through the whole class, just for the experiment's sake. And you get all these measures and you, and you go through and you give all these ones, and you go back and remeasure it. And the, uh, the part of the body which was lacking, the gland or the what have you, organ, that was lacking in energy, has now come up very markedly, very near to, much nearer to where the uh, reading is, which the manufacturer says is normal. What are you actually measuring? I don't know. I agreed with the MDs that this was not a satisfactory measurement in the sense that it was not reproducible. Mary Smith didn't necessarily get the same uh, response and the same figure as John Jones. But on the other hand, if Mary Smith showed the thyroid low, you would be measuring literally on top of the skin here, then John Jones would also show the thyroid low, though the measurement might not be the same. What the actual measurement was, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. It might be the terrible thing. There were probably, there were probably uh, res there were resistance bridges, Wheatstone bridges. They were Wheatstone bridges, oh, but... GSR, but I think this was a heat the measuring, the heat sensing, the heat thermal couple. Do you think that was a heat thing? I don't know. There's, there's so many of those different kinds of things. At any rate, what I'm trying to say to all of you is that there is a certain amount of evidence which seems to indicate that the field around individual organs is real. 
another difference, <clears throat> that it becomes less adequate and more adequate in accordance with what you do to the individual. Now those same devices, microdynamics no, but the radionics measurement, yes, also gave you what it called normal readings, normal readings for individuals of certain ages. And very interestingly, the readings went up from childhood to about age 25, and then it started down. And gradually, it, deteriorated. it slid down the curve until you got a 60-year-old indicating much less energy than a 25-year-old. And interestingly enough, the peak there was at 25. It wasn't at 40, where you'd expect it to be. And this is not necessarily in accord with what we'd have to think. We would think of a man as being in the, the real prime of his life, 35 to 40. This said no, so the man is in the prime of his life, 25. Uh, this also could give one very interesting reading. It could read and tell you who could use the machine. <laughs> it was right, too. It was right. <laughs> Said I could use it. <laughs> uh, and it said that John Jones couldn't use it, and John Jones couldn't use it. You see, it, it was a psychic measurement. The man was bugged in psychically, and it was somehow a psychic reading on the part of the individual to a machine which was basically a schlanky machine and into which he was plugged in himself. But as I say, I'm bringing it out at this point only to show you that there are certain way out indications. That this is actually so in the sense of the individual organs have their individual fields, are creating their own individual uh, energy fields in terms of their adequate response and maybe Peter Levine over there someday will devise a method which will be acceptable to measure this stuff. Now this was very useful in terms of the chiropractice, for instance, in terms of diagnosis. And uh, it was a very useful machine anyway, so on, for those that accepted it. But you see, it makes it more likely that what you really, it, it gives just a slight weight of evidence that the claim is true, that a body is the algebraic sum of these various energy fields. You don't really have to look that far for way out evidence. You just have to look at Don, for example. Um, you know, You're talking before. about plugging yourself into the field. Yeah. I am living in 1970 and know that practically every other uh, American in America wants a machine plug in. Well, that's true. But anyhow, I mean, you just have to look at, you know, working around his ankle, I not know. above his knees. I know. And it's a uh, I know. gross chain. But you chain people are ahead. seeing the mountain from a different side. And when you get through, I hope, 20 years from now, there are, be, are going to be a great many people on your side of the mountain. But in the meantime, they all get together down in the dining room in Esalen. And some of them believe, and say, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And some of them say, this is a hell of a note. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's you that have to fight it. I live up here in the river house, thank God. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, it is true. As far as I am concerned, Peter, I look at Don or anyone else that's been worked on in this room, Sharon was an outstanding picture of this, an outstanding picture. Uh, had you been using one of those machines on Sharon, you would have found a low reading on the spine. You would have gone down the spine and you would have found a very low reading in the lumbars. Uh, etc., etc., and it would have given you this kind of a diagnosis. Who needs it? Not you people. But for those that like it, they like it. Anyway, so what we are saying is that if this is true, we are looking for a different way of changing the level of operations of the body as a whole, not by plugging in a machine down in Carmel or over in Texas, to broadcast 
waves to somebody's, to Sharon's second lumbar or fourth. Because what we say is that if you broadcast waves to second lumbar or fourth, tomorrow morning or even five minutes after they start broadcasting, she may say, you know, I'm feeling better now. But this isn't going to do the job. Because the same thing that broke down that second lumbar, namely the failure of the stacking of the blocks is going to be there tomorrow morning and it's going to break it down again. So what we are looking for is a different approach which will be solid, which having built does not fall apart. And we claim that if we stack those blocks so that it, according to the laws of the mechanics of physics, we get the result. Now you must not forget that you are literally working with gravity as a tool. Many of you people come to me and you're complaining bitterly every step along the way. So and so got me at the table last night and he said so and so. What is Rolfing? What do they claim? What do they do? And he said I didn't know what to say about it. So then somebody with a little more enterprise tries to tell them about those blocks. But you see, what fails to be represented most of the time is the fact that it is this gravity operation that you are dealing with. You are failing to take those people to whom you are talking and stretch their minds to the place where they realize that they are operating in a gravitational field. These people are not. They're still operating in the good old Aristotelian field, and a man is a man is a man. And he's a little animal, and he grows out of some woman's womb, and he grows, and he grows, and he grows up to here, and then he slides down like that. And this isn't what you're saying. I'm making myself very tiresome, repeating and repeating and repeating this. But you go watch yourselves and see how when you try to talk about this, you will go back to your old field of expression. I am going to fix his liver. No, you're not. His liver's going to fix himself, fix itself. <coughs> what you can do is to fix those blocks. And you fix those blocks by virtue of the fascial body. You are working in and through the fascial body. You are working in and through. you cannot work with. If you are getting improvement, and maybe we'll have, I doubt it, I was going to say, maybe we'll have the good luck here. People come in here, and six months ago, they had hepatitis, infectious hepatitis, and they're having the time of their life complaining about how they never got out of that hepatitis. And as you go into that abdomen, palpating it, you realize that they're right. Their liver is halfway down to their pubes. And you go through your first hour, and you go back and you take a look at that abdomen, and lo and behold, the liver's up where it flows. It's the same as some of you saw with that art the other day. But you are working through the fascial body. It is the way you relate the fascia and the fascial planes and the fascial strains that then reorganizes what's going on inside them, what's going on next to them, etc., etc. I don't know, lots of you don't believe a word of it, that's all right. Uh, so, now, we take in that first hour and we are dealing with the othermost, the most superficial fascial layer. And because all fascial layers are connected, you're going to be dealing with the fascial layers of the things that are giving you the problem. That liver that I've just been talking about.
And the first hour was a demonstration of just exactly this. You were getting those fascia, that outside fascia reorganized, repatterned. And you knew that you were repatterning it correctly if you got the pelvic basin horizontal or approach. And you went into your repatterning with the idea of making that pelvic basin horizontal because this was the position where it worked. And so the first thing you did was to get the thorax climbing off that pelvic basin because there were all kinds of communications between the pelvic basin and the rib cage. Communications in the sense of muscles, in the sense of fascia, <coughs> sense of tendons, always in the sense of mesoderm. <coughs> and you had the good luck, the sheer unadulterated good luck to completely change the